and uh, look at this um, case study uh, in terms of the publication, in terms of approaching uh, and addressing qualification. So I'll hand back to Karen for that. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, well, thank you very much for taking part in that poll. And I think especially that last question as well, because um, as you're going to see in the next um, few slides, there's quite a lot of work involved. Um, and I think certainly looking at the approaches, um, you know, that we've been using. And uh, so it was just interesting to uh, gauge what the uh, priorities are likely to be going forward. So, you know, obviously, um, you know, in terms of the qualification areas, um, we've got, you know, SIP inhibition itself, which can consist of uh, competitive and also mechanism-based inhibition. There's SIP induction alone or in combination with mechanism-based inhibition. We've got transporters, you know, the OATs, the OATP1B1s, um, you know, PGP, BCRP. And uh, in terms of the SIP enzymes as well, um, you know, we've got uh, a number of different uh, SIP enzymes in terms of inhibition and induction that we have to consider. Um, special populations, uh, you know, we've been uh, doing a lot of work on uh, pediatrics, organ impairment, pregnancy, certainly over the last few years, and uh, been a lot of emerging publications on the, uh, you know, the applications here. But you know, I think these are just some of the key areas. I mean, we haven't even mentioned UGTs or or any other, uh, you know, phase two enzymes here. As, uh, but, you know, what we're trying to say here is, is that when we're thinking of qualification, what we have to be thinking about are the mechanisms, the enzymes and the uh, different populations. And, uh, and therefore, it's important, I think, when we're thinking of the approach that we um, think of them in terms of these areas and how we're going to move things forward. So in terms of the actual uh, qualification approaches, um, you know, obviously uh, what we have to do is um, identify and collate these examples. Um, you know, we've mentioned several times that there are lots of publications on the application of the uh, SIMSIP simulator uh, from many of the consortium members, uh, different research groups. There is a lot of ongoing work. And it takes time to identify and collate these examples because they may be uh, may have been, been performed in different versions. Um, and so it, it's a case of pulling all of these together. What we can do as well is, um, you know, perhaps run simulations ourselves, try and pull all of this data together and submit as a single publication on a single uh, mechanism or a single enzyme. Also, as we've mentioned previously, that um, you know sometimes when submitting the PBK reports for specific investigational drugs to regulators, you know they've been submitted alongside short reports describing the context of use and providing supporting data in the form of compound file summaries, but also independent analyses for these. And of course, what we can do as well is go for formal qualification with the EMA. So one of the things that we decided to do was actually start with the um, you know, qualification and um, in terms of uh, SIP inhibition. And what we focused on was um, you know, uh, SIP182, SIP2C8, SIP2C9, 2C19, 2D6, and 3A. And we looked at competitive inhibition and uh, mechanism-based inhibition. Now, obviously, at the time of doing this, um, you know, we could have gone to the literature, had a look to see what was there, collated all of this, um, talked about the different versions um, that, uh, that were available. But this is extremely time consuming, valuable, but time consuming. And then how do you actually put this together in a, in a single report that can actually be used to qualify a specific mechanism or a specific SIP enzyme? So what we decided to do was actually um, do an analysis ourselves. And, uh, and if, if you think back to one of the earlier slides that I presented, uh, what, what we talked about was the fact that a qualification database was required. And we're referring to it here as a qualification DDI matrix. And uh, so what we did, and I'm using the royal we here because, of course, it was all my colleagues at SIMSEP who did this. Um, what they did was um, look in the University of Washington Drug Interaction Database for all clinical DDIs involving these following enzymes here. And this alone was a huge amount of work, but we felt it was extremely valuable to do. 
Because typically what happens is um, if we submit a PBBK report, you know, the question that comes back is, well, you know, um, provide qualif qualifying documentation. And we felt that it was important for us to know for each of these enzymes, how many clinical DDI studies are there actually out there and to have all of this information collated together. And then what we did was focus on those DDIs where we had compound files available within the simulator. So that was the initial focus. And then after that, what we did was, um, you know, in terms of look for the FDA recommended reference substrates and also inhibitors. But what we'd done previously anyways, most of the compound files that we have within the sim SimSip simulator in include these FDA recommended reference substrates anyway. But also we felt it important that we try and capture, you know, inhibitors and uh, so weak, moderate and strong inhibitors and substrates that were susceptible to differing degrees of inhibition. So once we'd done all of that analysis, then we went through and had a look at all of these and, um, and, and sorted them according to these criteria here. At the time as well, if there were any uh, inhibitors or um, substrates that we identified, what we tried to do was a feasibility analysis to see whether it was possible to uh, actually deter, uh, to develop a compound file for that. Because obviously for some of these enzymes where we may not have many clinical studies, it was important to try and increase this by, um, by you know, especially if we could, um, you know, add a substrate or an in inhibitor, you know, to boost the number of clinical DDI studies overall. So it was quite a, a you know, laborious process. And what we ended up with was um, 123 clinical studies involving competitive inhibition. So CYP1A2, CYP2C8, um, and you can see here that not surprisingly for CYP3A4, we've got 62 studies available. And for CYP2C8, four studies, and for CYP2C19, four. And again, this, this, and so we had a lot of discussion at the time sort of saying, okay, well, you know, for, should we just go with CYP3A4 because we've got a lot of studies there and CYP2D6? But at the end of the day, you know, these are the studies that were available. Um, the substrates um, that are available are pretty robust. And also, if you look at these CYP competitive inhibition mechanism, for most of these enzymes, it's similar across the board. And therefore, what we decided to do is go for these uh, five CYP enzymes here. Oh, sorry, six CYP enzymes. In terms of mechanism-based inhibition, we found a total of 78 studies. Again, not surprising, 52 CYP3A4. And uh, in terms of 2C8, slightly more. So these were the studies that were carried through Workspaces were prepared for all of these, and the simulations were run using uh, version 19. Now, again, I keep coming back to the um, DDI matrix, and this is important because, you know, if we want to have a high level of confidence in this, it's important for us to have a range of different substrates for a range of different inhibitors, and that essentially these compound files are being cross-verified. So in other words, what we don't want to end up with is a midazolam substrate that's only been verified with ketoconazole. What we've got is a midazolam substrate that's been verified against um, cimetidine, cyclosporin, fluconazole, you know, fluvoxamine, itraconazole, and ketoconazole. And that's what we're trying to show here, the fact that each of these substrates, each of these inhibitors has been cross-verified, and that is why we're referring it to it as a DDI matrix. So this is the DDI matrix for competitive inhibition and also for mechani mechanism-based inhibition. And what we're showing on the right-hand side here are just whether they're clinically sensitive substrates, moderate um, or moderate strong weak inhibitors. And uh, obviously the size of the box is indicative of the uh, number of clinical DDI studies. Importantly, um, if you think back to the uh, qualification criteria that the um, EMA indicated, they said that it would be nice to have a good spread of drug substances. And uh, so what we did as well within the publication is we indicated what the FM values were for each of the substrate, what the bioavailabilities were, and also the FG and FH values. And importantly, um, if we're thinking about CYP3A4 substrates, um, 
you know, ideally to, to have the ideal qualification data set, what we would want is to have a spread like this so that if we've got a substrate that is metabolized by 50% 50, 50 by 3A4 and um, a low to moderate bioavailability, that it would actually be captured by this data set that we're seeing here. And on the left-hand side, you can see that what we've got are the substrates and their FM values for the other respective enzymes. And the, um, in terms of the SIP inhibitors, um, there were about 24 inhibitors involved in the analysis. I'm not showing all of them here, but what I'm showing you are the type of data that we actually provided in the uh, suppl supplementary uh, table. And it's important, I think, just to talk you through this, because typically for the SIP inhibitors, when we're developing the uh, compound files, um, what we try and do is obviously have the files as mechanistic as possible, but sometimes for these inhibitors, if we don't know how they're metabolized, then we might have them represented by their PK data. Then we would put in the um, in vitro inhibition characteristics, verify that we can capture the observed exposures, and then run the simulations against substrates. What we're indicating here is the, whether the KI values, they've been corrected for binding, but whether they were optimized or used on the basis of in vitro data. And for these KI values and also the inactivation parameters, they, a meta-analysis was done for each of them based on all of the data that were available in the literature, corrected for the non-specific microsomal binding. And these are the substrates as they stand in the version 19. And, um, it's, and, and of course, what we tried to do as well was capture the, um, you know, whether there were strong or moderate or weak um, inhibitors. So I've got a couple of slides here. Um, what I don't want to do is talk you through all of the results. Yeah, what I'm trying to show you here are the, the elements of the information that we've provided within the paper and how that can help you when determining, um, you know, qualification and context of use. So. What we've done is we've represented the data in terms of changes in Cmax and AUC ratio according to the different mechanisms. So this is what we can see in this particular plot here. Graphs A and B refer to competitive inhibition. C and D refer to mechanism-based inhibition. And we've got these sorted according to SIP enzyme. In the table next to it, what we've done is also indicated what the average fold error is, the bias and the precision with respect to competitive inhibition, mechanism-based inhibition, and each of the individual SIP enzymes. Also, what we've done as well for the competitive inhibition, we've uh, indicated by substrate, indicated by inhibitor, and also we've provided the same level of information with respect to uh, mechanism-based inhibition here. And this is so that if there was a specific drug that you were interested in, we've got the granularity here that allows you to look at a specific drug-drug um, interaction. So in terms of the context of use, the main reason why we separated all of those um, the, according to that level of detail was because if you've got an investigational drug and you're wanting to focus on competitive inhibition or mechanism-based inhibition, those data are there. If you're looking at a specific SIP enzyme, those data are there. If you're interested in looking at the mechanism, the SIP enzyme by substrate and inhibitor, then we have those data available as well. And as I said, this is really important because it allows discussion of the qualification data set for context of use. And so, in other words, if we're talking about, if we've got a CYP3A4 drug, I'm going back to the initial example, and what we're trying to do is say that what we want to do is waive clinical studies involving weak and moderate CYP3A4 inhibitors. We've got our report submitted for our specific investigational drug, and what we could do is then use the information from this data set here in terms of context of use and say that we've provided evidence here showing that the CYP3A4 weak and moderate inhibitors perform well against the compound files described in this analysis. So I think when also it's important when we do these types of analysis that we make it clear 
um, what were the key findings and what can we actually provide in terms of guidance? Well, obviously, the main point of the paper was to run all of the simulations for those six uh, enzymes for mechanism-based inhibition and also uh, competitive inhibition and say, fantastic, we've got substrates and inhibitors that predict very well. And therefore, if you use a, if you've got an investigational drug, which you're looking at as a victim drug, these are the guidances that we can provide. So for a number of the substrates included in the DDI qualification matrix, a clinical DDI study was used to optimize their FM values. I mean, obviously, what we do initially is we take the in vitro data, we would run a simulation, determine whether we could capture the DDI, uh, the clinical DDI. If not, we would refine that FM value to, to show that we can actually capture that. And or we would utilize, you know, the mass balance data along with in vitro metabolism data to actually refine the relative contributions and the clearance routes. So, at this point, what we are saying is that for most of the substrates that we have within the database, we used a clinical DDI study or mass balance data to actually refine the um, clearance mechanisms. And therefore, if you want to use this as a qualification data set, what we're saying is that if you had an investigational drug and you were able to demonstrate using clinical DDI data, then this would act as a qualification data set. But this is quite typical anyway. This is what we tend to find with CYP3A4 substrates, that we tend to use a clinical DDI study to, to refine it. So there's nothing new here, but just to make it clear what we're talking about in terms of context of use and uh, qualification data set. So now this to me is the uh, more interesting aspect because this is often what we find is early on in drug um, development, we might know what the inhibitory potency of a drug is, but not necessarily know how it's metabolized and all the different um, clearance routes involved. And so what we wanted to do was try and break this down. What we found is that of the 18 CYP3A4 inhibitors used in the study, only three of them had optimized KI values. So what we're trying to do is provide guidance here. So if you've got an investigational drug that inhibits CYP3A4, then what we are saying is that what we can do is if you've got a positive control KI value that is also in our data set here, what you can do is essentially calibrate that. Or if it's similar, if the KI values for the positive controls are quite similar, then we can say that we have confidence in your KI, um, in vitro determined KI value and run a simulation with that and uh, without doing any uh, sensitivity analysis and that you're probably more likely to be confident in that. But obviously, if you flag a positive or a clinically significant DDI, then you would want to do a sensitivity analysis just to sort of see what range you're actually um, falling into. And of course, this comes on to the uh, next slide here, where what we're talking about are the other enzymes so among the 30% of inhibitors, um, where so 37% so of the inhibitors, an optimized KI value was used. And, uh, and the, um, the difference between the optimized and in vitro values was about, ten, about tenfold. So what we're saying here is that if you've got an investigational drug and you want to assess the DDI liability, that we would recommend dropping the KI value by up to about tenfold and doing a sensitivity analysis here. And that this qualification data set can be used to actually support this because this was one of the findings that we've got from actually doing this analysis. So this was obviously just some of the key aspects. I haven't even talked about the mechanism-based inhibition, but within the paper itself, we've also indicated important steps that if you've got an investigational drug that's a mechanism-based inhibit inhibitor, what the recommendations would be. What we're trying to show you in that publication is the level of detail you know, that we've provided I haven't even mentioned the fact that for each of those inhibitors and each of those substrates, we have the supporting um, compound file summaries in version 19, all of which can be actually, um, you know, contribute towards a formal qualification process. So what we've decided to do is with respect to SIP inhibition and competitive and MBI is obviously we've collated all of these examples. We've done a formal analysis, shown that the compound files within version 19 um, perform well. 
And so what we're going to do now is we're actually going to submit this uh, work as um, for formal EMA qualification. So we've got the publication just to fast track and make those data available to everyone. But now we're going to go through the formal qualification, which can uh, obviously take about up to a year. But obviously what we have to think about are the other areas. What about SIP induction? You know, obviously in the poll that we conducted earlier, this is why we were interested to know your thoughts. There's SIP induction. And again, we consider it alone or in combination with mechanism-based inhibition. There are transporters, special populations, pediatrics, organ impairment, all of these areas that you indicated an interest in. So what we're going to do and what we have been doing is going through the same process again that we've gone through for the uh, SIP inhibition, where we um, identify um, you know, studies involving SIP in induction. We also collate examples from the literature that, that we can use in the meantime until we've done this supporting analysis. And at some point in the future, we can go for a formal EMA qualification. But obviously, we have to make sure that we have enough relevant examples in order to be able to do that. So in the meantime, what can we do with respect to special populations? 